Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to, to be here with you to, to worship God together and to, to praise His name. Let's stand and sing together our first hymn, Love Divine. Redemption and life for all, 
who will freely receive it by putting their trust in you. You are a wonderful Savior, you are a wonderful God. We bow before you and give you all the adoration and praise that is yours. Because you gave your all for us. Everything we have of, of, of lasting value and worth comes not from ourselves, it comes only from you. We are eternally indebted to you. Our hearts are filled with, with joy and thanks and, and hope and wonder this morning because of who you are and what you give for us. Lord, as we are gathered as a family in this place, we are mindful of those uh, not here this morning, those not here because of, of ill health. We pray for your healing hand upon them, that they would know that, that though physically apart from us, they are one of us in spirit. We pray for those of our church family who mourn, we ask for your comfort. And Lord, this morning also we lift up our land before you. We, we think of what happened in, in Plymouth this week, that terrible atrocity. Draw near to those whose lives have been shattered by it. Meet them with your comfort. Surround them with your love. Beyond them all that they need. And Lord, this morning we also think of the, the terrible situation in Afghanistan, with city after city and town after town being overrun by the, the Taliban. Women and, and young ladies and girls who had tasted freedom and, and opportunity, that, that that being taken away from them. Lord, we pray that, that this advance would be stayed. Lord, that, that women and, and young ladies and, and girls, and indeed all people in that land, that they would receive the, the help they need. We pray for, for what's left of the Afghanistan government and, and army. We ask, Lord, that, that you would just enable them to, to make a stand and to protect their people. Lord, this morning we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us and that you would change us from the inside out into your likeness. Now we join our prayers together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Over the, the next number of months, uh, when I'm with you, uh, barring special occasions, I, I'd like us to look together at the life of King David. David had flaws and, and weaknesses that we can all relate to. Uh, and he went through our, our days of, of emotional trauma and all sorts of challenges that, that we can identify with. Yet through it all, God was, was with him and he'd and he done something remarkable and amazing through this weak, frail, flawed man as, as, as he looked to God in trust. So there's a lot for us to, to learn as we live together at the life of King David. And we're, we're starting at the, the very beginning, um, Saul's anointing of David this morning. Our Samuel's anointing of David. We're, we're looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. 
The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? They are still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ram. We thank God for his word to us. Let's sing together because he lives.
Let's pray together before we look at God. Lord, we thank you for your word that it is living and true and powerful. We thank you that it pierces through to your hearts what you alone see. And we ask now that through your spirit you will do a work of grace in our lives and move us forward in our walk with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Some time ago, my younger brother Alan, who's a farmer, walked into his local veterinary surgery in order to purchase some supplies. After greeting the lady at the counter, he asked politely if she could get him the medicines he came for. She looked at him with an expression of incredulity and then said in a harsh tone, get it yourself. Who made me your servant? I have my own work to do. In the man standing in front of her, she was sure that she saw rudeness, inconsiderateness and laziness. And she didn't hesitate to put him in his place. Not only was she wrong about that, she was also wrong about who this person was. She thought it was Colin, Alan's identical twin brother, who works as a vet in that practice. The message of this passage is what that lady discovered when Alan told her his name. That message is this. No matter how highly we rate our powers of discernment, no matter how sure we think we are, ultimately we don't know what's in the heart of the person in front of us. Because unlike God, we don't see their heart. This being the case means that all judgment and the putting of people in their place must be left to God. As we look at these verses, we will see what's in the heart of the person God uses for his glory. And also how we should relate to, to everyone around us, given the fact that unlike God, we don't see their heart. So what's in the heart of the person God uses for his glory? The answer is trust in his saving, equipping grace that he freely offers to all. For around 400 years, God ruled over his people Israel as their king. He delivered them from numerous enemies who were mightier than themselves. And every time they strayed, he forgave and restored them with an unending patience and tenderness. After all this, they reject him by saying, we want a king like all the nations around us who will lead us into battle as their kings do. In response to their demand, God commanded the prophet Samuel to anoint Saul to be king. At first glance, he was a very impressive choice. Not only was Saul head and shoulders taller than everyone else, he came across as humble, well-mannered and sincere. He was someone that the men of Israel could look to and draw confidence from as they marched into battle. God said to the people, as long as you and your king continue to, to follow and obey me, all will be well. But Samuel did not follow and obey. Instead of trusting in God, he chose to trust in himself. Instead of acting for God's glory, he chose to act for his own glory. As a result, God proclaimed to Saul through Samuel that he had rejected him from being king. This passage starts with God telling Samuel to stop mourning over Saul. All is not lost with his falling away from me. I've got a perfect plan that the, his acts of faithfulness have not thwarted. Go to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Literally in the Hebrew, I have seen for myself a king among his sons. At a sacrificial feast which Samuel hosted, the sons of Jesse were paraded before him. The first one to pass by was Eliab, the eldest. 
having not learned his lesson from Saul's demise. Samuel assumed that Eliab's impressive physique and charming persona meant that he was the perfect choice to be king. God responded to Samuel's assumption with this telling rebuke. Verse 7. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. Outward appearance or charm play no part in God's decision-making process. All that matters to him is the heart, which he alone sees. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, we are told that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. A person whose heart is blameless is a person who is the same on the inside as they appear to be on the outside. Their praise of God, both private and public, comes from, from nothing else but an inner delight in him. Their deeds of service, both, both seen and unseen, come from nothing else but an inner desire to please God and do his will. God has offered them his saving, equipping grace through his son, Jesus. They have responded by receiving it in childlike trust. That's what David did. A few years later, when God assures David that his family's reign over Israel will last forever, ultimately through his descendant, Jesus, David doesn't respond by saying, finally, all my efforts to make myself a better person have paid off. Rather, he says, who am I and what is my household that you have brought me thus far? At the end of David's life, after he and his people give sacrificially and substantially for, for the building of the temple, he doesn't say to God, look at what I've done for you, now you owe me big time. Rather, he exclaims in humility, who am I and what is my people? that we should be able to offer willingly. All things come from you, and of your own we have given you. Keep forever such thoughts and purposes in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. David rightly saw himself as having earned and deserved nothing. The more good deeds that David did for God, the more he felt indebted to God for the provision and grace that enabled and inspired him to do them. God's eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking first and foremost not for the powerful, the eloquent, the, the learned or the influential, but rather for frail, broken sinners like you and me who will put their trust in his Son for salvation and depend on him for everything. Frail, broken sinners like you and me, who see their failures and, and inabilities, of which there are many, not as a sign to give up and stay on the sidelines, but rather as a sign to turn to the one who is our sufficiency for everything he calls us to do. In the heart of the person God uses for his glory. There is trust in and reliance upon nothing else except his saving, equipping grace that he freely gives to all through his Son, Jesus. Given the fact that unlike God, we don't see inside the hearts of those around us, how should we relate to them? As Samuel learned after God rebuked him, we should have an open heart toward everyone that leaves the choosing pronouncements and judgments to God. Each of us unavoidably discern attitudes and motivations 
in the hearts of, of those we interact with. We can't help it. The temptation we must resist is the temptation to treat what we discern as if it is fact. Like the lady in the veterinary surgery, no matter how highly we rate our powers of discernment, no matter how sure we think we are, we can be completely and utterly wrong. And even if we are right, what we have picked up on is not the whole story. We don't know what that person has to contend with, how far God has brought them, and how far he will bring them. When we sum people up and write them off, on the basis of what we see and sense, we are standing in God's way. His work of grace in their life can infinitely exceed any limit we set for them. We can be a channel through whom that grace is brought to them, or a blockage in the pipe that stops it reaching them. The next time you unintentionally find yourself in a huddle of people, who are discussing the unseen motives of those who have taken on roles and stepped up to the plate when others wouldn't, walk away from that huddle, or better yet, shut that conversation down. Through his Son, Jesus Christ, God will do a work of transformation in the lives of those who say yes to his call, even if they have rough edges. But he can't do a work of transformation in the lives of those who say no, regardless of how politely and charmingly they say it. If your walk with God to this point has contained more no's than yes's, be more concerned about your own soul than the soul of those who have said yes. If someone's heart is false, God doesn't need you to cut the legs out from under them and to give them both barrels. He is more than capable of dealing with them by himself. Live with an open heart toward all. An open heart that leaves the choosing pronouncements and judgments to God. Think the best of those you interact with that it's possible to think. Extend to them mercy, kindness, support and encouragement. Time and time again, God will blow your expectations away by what he does in their lives. If on the other hand, you shut your heart and close the book with regard to those around you. Not only will you miss out on seeing God's work in the world, you'll also miss out on experiencing the, the wonder of it in your own life. A couple of years ago, at a large Christian conference, I listened to an American lady by the name of Rosaria Butterfield share how she came to know Jesus. In the year 1999, she was an English professor at Syracuse University. She was also a militant feminist, living in a same-sex relationship and on a war path against Christianity. When a Christian organization came to town and pitched up their tent across the road from her campus, she wrote a stinging article against them in a local paper. The article was brought to the attention of a, a local minister called Ken Smith by his assistant who told him, this lady is dangerous, we need to shut her down. Prompted by the warning, Ken wrote Rosaria a letter which she described as the nicest letter of opposition she ever received. Ken didn't argue with my article, she noted. Rather, he asked me to defend the presuppositions that undergirded it. With, with, with questions such as, how did you arrive at your interpretations? How do you know you're right? 
The letter also contained an invitation to dinner, which Rosario accepted, largely because she thought she could use Ken for, for research, for a book she was writing about the evils of Christianity. Rosario's dinner meetings with Ken and his wife, Floyd, soon became about much more than research. In her own words, Ken and his wife, Floyd, and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and, and politics. And they didn't act as if such conversations were actually polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate when we ate together, which we did weekly at the Smith House for at least two years before I ever stepped foot in a church. At the first meal in their home, Ken omitted two very important steps in the rule book of how Christians are supposed to deal with a heathen like me. Number one, he didn't share the gospel with me. And number two, he didn't invite me to church. Because of these omissions, I knew that when Ken extended his hand to me in friendship, it was safe for me to close my hand in his. You see, I was not Ken's project. I was Ken's neighbour. This was not friendship evangelism. This was friendship. Consequently, I started meeting with Ken and Floyd regularly to study the Bible in earnest with pen in hand and notebook on my lap. Describing what transpired from this study of God's word with her friends, Rosario said, the Bible got to be bigger inside me than I was. It overflowed into my world and soon led me to put my trust in Jesus to be my saviour. Since then, Rosario has not looked back. She is now working in partnership with her husband, a Reformed Presbyterian minister, extending to others the same kind of hospitality that brought the church to her when she was as far from it as she could possibly be. As Samuel learnt, as Ken Smith did, as Rosario now does, live with an open heart toward all. An open heart that leaves the choosing pronouncements and judgments to God. Think the best of those you interact with that it's possible to think. Be a channel of God's grace by extending his help, patience, kindness and compassion to everyone you meet. You will be blown away by what God does in their lives and in yours. His purposes and the saving power of his Son are infinitely higher and greater than anything you can see and comprehend. There is no heart in which God's word of salvation and life cannot become bigger than one's own agenda and desires, and thus no heart that can't respond to that word. By putting its complete trust in it. This is all God lives for. For the first time or afresh, surrender your life to Jesus in total dependency on what he has done for you. Recommit yourself to living as a channel of his grace that will lead others to do likeness. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We thank God for his word to us this morning. Amen. And stand and sing our closing hymn, There is a Redeemer.
Thank you, O oh, our Father, for giving us your Son. He died to pay the price we could not pay, so that we might receive that saving, equipping grace of simple trust that transforms us from the inside out, of hearts changed by you to be channels of your grace in this world. We go forth to share your love and patience and, and kindness with everyone we meet, so that through us they might meet you. Lead us forth and use us for your glory, as we depend on you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>